Welcome back to another video on our series of statistical thermodynamics. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of math involved so far, and I promise you I'm trying to make things as painless as possible. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, math really is the language of the universe, and it allows us to make very powerful predictions. And so to continue to lay the groundwork of statistical mechanics that will allow us to describe real systems, we're going to have to do more derivations. Recall that the reason we're doing this is so you can see where these equations come from, and I don't just want to give you the equations with no explanation. In this video, we're going to work on deriving the partition function, which is one of the most important tools when performing statistical mechanics. Let's motivate this derivation a bit first. In our first video, we defined a property called entropy, and we said that it was related to the number of ways that a system can be arranged. This property is critical in working with very large systems, and if possible, systems will move to increasing entropy simply due to the higher probability of finding a system in a state that has more configurations. We define entropy mathematically as being equal to a constant, known as the Boltzmann constant, multiplied by the natural log of the number of ways that the system can be arranged. Each way that the system can be arranged is known as a microstate, and one of the assumptions that we made is that each microstate is equally likely from the ergodic hypothesis which is the fundamental postulate of statistical mechanics. One of the requirements of the configurations of the system is that all of the configurations have the same energy, volume, and number of particles. And we gave this collection of configurations a name, the microcanonical ensemble. However, we wanted to look at systems that did not necessarily have the same energy, but were at the same temperature, as temperature is a much simpler variable to control. Doing this moved us into the canonical ensemble, the collection of systems that have the same temperature, volume, and number of particles, and thus these are the new natural variables. Unfortunately, when we move to this ensemble, we can no longer use the Boltzmann definition of entropy as each configuration no longer necessarily has the same probability of occurring. However, we also define the Gibbs entropy equation, which states that the entropy is equal to the negative Boltzmann constant multiplied by the summation of the individual probabilities for each microstate multiplied by the natural log of those probabilities. This equation is more general, and we can use it to define the entropy of this new system. If I told you the probabilities of the microstates in the ensemble and the number of microstates, you could somewhat easily compute the entropy. However, what if you didn't know the probabilities? Is there a way to calculate them from other information about the system? In truth there is, and this is the derivation that we're going to do today. Once again, I will give the results of the derivation here because this is going to get a bit mathematical but I hope that you will enjoy learning how these equations are derived instead of just being given as a fact. The first equation we will derive is called the Boltzmann factor, and it gives the ratio of probabilities between two states. This can be written in many ways, but the most straightforward form is that the probability of state u divided by the probability of state v is equal to the natural number e raised to the negative energy of state u divided by the Boltzmann constant multiplied by the temperature divided by the same expression for state v. Next, we will derive the partition function q, which is the summation over all states of the natural number e raised to the negative energy for each individual state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature. Finally, we will derive the Boltzmann distribution, which states that the probability of a state u is equal to the natural number e raised to the negative energy of state u divided by the Boltzmann factor times the temperature, all divided by the partition function q. Let's start this derivation with the Boltzmann definition of entropy, which states that the entropy of a system with fixed energy, volume, and number of particles is equal to the Boltzmann factor multiplied by the natural log of the number of ways that the system can be arranged. I can rearrange this equation by dividing by the Boltzmann factor and raising both sides by the natural number to get that the number of ways that a system can be arranged is equal to the natural number raised to the entropy of the system divided by the Boltzmann constant. Next. Recall that in our canonical ensemble of systems, each system may have a slightly different energy, but it is at the same temperature. If we take a look at an individual system, we could write an expression for the entropy of that system, such that the number of ways that individual states of that system could be arranged is equal to the natural number raised to the entropy for that system divided by the Boltzmann constant. Next, let's suppose I want to write a ratio of the number of ways the system I can be arranged divided by the number of ways that system j can be arranged. Simple enough, we just write this expression twice with the expression for system i in the numerator and system j in the denominator. 
Using properties of exponents, I can condense this into one expression in a couple of steps, and I get that the ratio of the number of ways the system i and system j can be arranged is equal to the natural number raised to the negative difference of the entropy of system j and system i divided by Boltzmann's constant. In our previous video on deriving the classical expression for entropy and the definition of temperature, we showed that a change in entropy is equal to a change in energy divided by the temperature. Thus, the difference in entropy between system J and system I is equal to the difference in energy between system J and system I divided by the temperature. Thus, returning to our derived equation, the ratio of the number of ways the system I can be arranged divided by the number of ways that system J can be arranged is equal to the negative difference between the energy of system J and the energy of system I divided by the Boltzmann constant multiplied by the temperature. Next, recall that for a state U in system I, the probability of being in state U is equal to 1 divided by the number of microstates in system I, as each microstate is equally likely. Thus, we can write that the number of microstates in system I is equal to 1 divided by the probability of being in state U. Thus, we can make substitutions here to get rid of the number of microstates for systems I and J, and express this in probabilities of states U and V. Next, recall that for an individual system I or J, the energy of each microstate in that system is constant, and thus the energy of system I would be equal to the energy for any individual microstate U in system I, and thus we can substitute our I's for U's and our J's for V's. At this point, we have derived the Boltzmann factor. Finally, we can rewrite this in a couple of ways that you might encounter. The first is dropping the difference in energies to a delta energy. But in this case, the final state is state V and the initial state is state U. And if you forget which is which, you will end up with the wrong sign and subsequently an inverse in the ratio you are trying to calculate. My personal favorite way to write the Boltzmann factor is to actually use our rules of exponents again here to separate this expression into a numerator and a denominator such that each given state only appears on the numerator or the denominator, but sometimes you only get the relative energy between states. All right, so at this point we have a nice expression for relative probabilities, but what about absolute probabilities, which is probably more interesting? As I mentioned, we can rearrange the expression for the Boltzmann factor so each state is either on the numerator or denominator. So you might conclude that the probability for an individual state is just the natural number E raised to the negative energy of the state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature. But unfortunately, this isn't quite correct. If we multiplied this expression by some constant number, we could end up with the same Boltzmann factor if we substituted this into our equation. And thus, the question remains as to what this constant factor is, and as a spoiler, it's unfortunately not 1. Let's call this constant 1 over q, and this q is the partition function. Consider that if we sum over all the possible states under our conditions, the total probability must be equal to 1. Thus, the sum over all states of the natural number E raised to the negative energy of a state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature all over Q must be equal to 1. As we mentioned, Q is a constant, and so we can remove 1 over Q from the equation, and relatively easily we see that Q must be equal to the summation of the natural number E raised to the negative energy of a state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature over all states. This is the definition of the partition function, and for a given system that we are studying, this value will be a constant. Thus, we can write the Boltzmann distribution as the probability for a given state being equal to the natural number E raised to the negative energy of that state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature, all divided by a summation over all possible states of the natural number E raised to the negative energy of a given state divided by the Boltzmann constant times temperature. I hear some grumbling in the audience, and that's because we still have a sum in the equation. If we only have a finite number of states, this is not too bad, but oftentimes we have an infinite number of possible states, and these are systems that we're looking to get into very soon. However, we do have a few tricks up our sleeve, most of which we will see later. If terms are really small in the partition function, we can often neglect them, and sometimes we're really lucky, and we're able to turn this sum into an integral we can do or the summation converges to a finite number. And in reality, this is very useful for doing real chemistry, 
where some of the other equations that we worked with, such as the Boltzmann entropy equation and the Gibbs entropy equations, may not have been. Now, there are a few interesting things that I'd like to point out about this equation, and we get our first bit of intuition for the Boltzmann distribution that is quite practical in many aspects of statistical mechanics. First, at a given temperature, the higher the energy of an individual state is, the less probable that state will be, as the exponent becomes larger, but as it is negative, the term becomes smaller. This is a statement that is often told to students as just being a fact of nature, that systems prefer to be at lower energies, but it actually can simply be traced back to our first principles of statistics and the conservation of energy, which is pretty neat if you ask me. To reiterate, at a given temperature, lower energy states are more probable than higher energy states. Next, let's consider how probabilities of states being observed changes as we change the temperature. Suppose that the temperature approaches infinity. The exponents would approach zero as the temperature is in the denominator, and any number raised to zero is equal to one. Thus, as temperature approaches infinity, the probability of a state being occupied is equal to one divided by the summation of one over all states. And this harkens back to our microcanonical ensemble, where every state is equally likely. Thus, as temperature increases, higher energy states are more likely to be populated than they would have been at lower temperatures. The inverse of this statement is also true, that as temperature decreases, high energy states become even less likely, and at a temperature of zero, which technically cannot be reached, only the lowest energy state will be populated. As I mentioned in the last video, in the future I will do a video on temperature and why it can't be negative, and I'll also discuss why it's technically impossible to reach a temperature of zero, although we can get really close. As a final exercise, let's turn to the physical chemist's favorite system, the two-level system. In this system, there are only two states. While we can make the energies whatever we would like them to be, you can try this out on your own with two non-zero energies for the levels to show it works both ways, we will say that the lower state has an energy of zero and the upper state has an energy epsilon. First, we write out our partition function, which only has two terms because we only have two states. We substitute in zero and epsilon for the energies, and after we see that the partition function is equal to E raised to zero plus E raised to negative epsilon divided by KB times temperature. We simplify this to one plus the second term. Let's write the probability of being in the lower level, or the ground state, and the probability of being in the upper level, or the excited state. We see that for our ground state, the probability is one divided by one plus E raised to negative epsilon divided by KBT, and the excited state probability is E raised to negative epsilon divided by KBT divided by the same denominator. Just as a check, we can add these two probabilities together and we see that they will cancel out to one as it should. Finally, what happens if temperature goes to infinity? The term representing the excited state will now have an infinity which simplifies to e raised to zero, which is one. This means that the probability of being in the excited state is one half, and the probability of being in the ground state is also one half, or that they're equal. If we allow t to approach zero, the term that represents the excited state now has an exponent of negative infinity, and this approaches zero. Thus, there is no probability that it will be in the excited state, and it must be in the ground state. Once again, I cannot stress how important this is in the field of physical chemistry. If you play around some more with these formulas, we see that if the change in energy of the excited state compared to the ground state is equal to KBT, it has a probability of being occupied about 27% of the time at thermal equilibrium. If it is one-tenth the energy of KBT, it has the probability of being occupied about 48% of the time, while 10 times the energy has a probability of being occupied 0.005% of the time. And this is why chemists and physicists often think about energy states relative to KBT. Assuming we have lots of atoms or molecules that can be in the ground or excited states, this tells us the population that will be in each state. Another interesting thing to note is that in a system where we have a large number of atoms or molecules, we never have what is known as a population inversion, where we would have more atoms or molecules in the excited state relative to the ground state at thermal equilibrium. If we measure how many molecules or atoms are in each state relative to each other, and we know the energy difference between the states, we can actually calculate the temperature of our system, which is a very fun lab that I was able to do in my physical chemistry laboratory in my undergraduate. At this point, I think that we have finally gotten to the first practical applications of statistical mechanics, and I'm sure glad we're here, seeing as it took us five videos. 
Thank you for watching this video on the derivation of the partition function and the Boltzmann distribution. If you enjoyed this video, please like and share this video as it helps out considerably in increasing outreach. If you'd like to see more videos on chemistry and physics topics, please consider subscribing to the channel. I have linked my Patreon page in the description below, and if you would like to support educational content like this, please consider donating. Finally, please comment down below if there is something you feel like I could make more clear, or if there are other topics you'd like me to cover. Thank you.